for female media's polity, I'm Lungile Nkompe. Joining me is author and political scientist, Professor Stephen Friedman, here to discuss his most recent book, Good Jew, Bad Jew. Your book offers critique of mainstream understandings of Jewishness. Can you talk to the title of your book and what are the characteristics of a good Jew and a bad Jew? Well, let me first say that when you talk about mainstream understandings, what are today mainstream understandings of being Jewish are, are not what used to be a mainstream understanding of being Jewish. Traditionally, obviously, being Jewish is being a member of an ethnic group and uh, for many, many years ascribing to a particular uh, set of religious ideas and beliefs. And what mainstream Jewishness has become today is, is supporting a state in the Middle East, which is, of course, never what, what being Jewish was all about. And that has created a situation because, uh, obviously, like all states and all political projects, uh, Zionism, which is the ideology which created the Israeli state, is controversial and it has its detractors, of which I'm obviously one. And many of those detractors are Jewish. So the detractors become the bad Jews because they are the Jews who do not buy into this mainstream understanding. And the good Jews are the ones who loyally and faithfully parrot whatever the Israeli state wants them to parrot. Obviously, my own view is that the good Jews are really the bad Jews, and the bad Jews are really the good Jews. But, you know, People who ascribe to my view on this issue didn't create this distinction between good and bad Jews in the first place. So in essence, as I say, a good Jew, in inverted commas, is a loyal supporter of the state of Israel and all its actions, and a bad Jew is somebody who criticizes those or distances themselves from those. Anti-Semitism is a serious issue in the world, but you think the term anti-Semitism is sometimes reinterpreted in order to stifle criticism and excuse wrongful behavior. Look, anti-Semitism, it's not a particularly good word, as, as, as I point out in the book, because Jews are Semitic, but then Arabs also Semitic. But in any event, we stuck with this term. Anti-Semitic means racism directed at Jews. And traditionally, that is what it has meant. It meant that people have a negative view of Jews for whatever reason. What it has now become, because, as I say, the good Jews are the Jews who support the Israeli state, it's now become criticism of the Israeli state. So it becomes an, an automatic knee-jerk reaction. If you criticize the Israeli state, if you say it, it, it should be replaced by a state which is open to, to everybody, which Jews and non-Jews can share alike, then you are regarded as anti-Semitic, which clearly is not true because you're not criticizing Jews. But if you have this misbelief, in a sense, that the state is the Jewish people, then obviously anybody who criticizes the state is anti-Semitic. Now, as I mentioned earlier, many of the people who criticize the state are Jewish. And so you have the rather strange situation where, in many cases, the majority of people who are being accused of anti-Semitic behavior and attitudes are themselves Jewish. So in other words, people who are themselves Jewish, I, I mentioned in the book uh, the case, I mean, there are many cases like that, but it just illustrates it so, uh, so well, of a, an 82-year-old British woman, a Jewish woman, who is uh, a very enthusiastic follower of the Jewish religion. She attends synagogues very regularly. She obeys the Jewish dietary laws, which many supporters of the Israeli state do not obey. And she was targeted as an anti-Semite because she believes that the Israeli state is racist. So what is happening is that attitudes towards a state are being misrepresented as attitudes towards people. And seeing that we are in South Africa, the best way of explaining this to people in Australia is, were people who opposed apartheid anti-white? Were they people who hated white people? No, of course they were not people who hated white people. They were people who believed that all South Africans should have equal rights. But labeling people who oppose the Israeli state as anti-Semitic is the same as saying that any person who fought against apartheid is anti-white and hates white people. Can you highlight some of the challenges associated with being critical of Israel as a Jewish person? 
Oh, well, at the very least, you are ostracized. You, you are not uh, permitted uh, to be part of the mainstream. I mean, obviously, it varies around the world. There are some, because the Jewish community in the United States, for example, is huge, it's big enough to have avenues of expression for Jewish people who are critical of the state of Israel. Whereas in South Africa, that's virtually non-existent. You have a small Jewish community, which is in lockstep behind the Israeli state. So really, if you are Jewish in South Africa and you want to express your opposition to behaviors and practices of the Israeli state, then you uh, are ostracized, you are marginalized, etc. Now, what we've seen of late is that this has got worse in the sense that it's not only a case of saying, well, you're not welcome at Jewish gatherings and you're not welcome at, in Jewish institutions. There are active attempts now to, for example, deprive Jewish academics of jobs because they are opponents of the Israeli state. Uh, I mean, just as an example, I don't, you know, this is not about me, it's about much bigger issues. But uh, some years ago, when I took a position at the University of Johannesburg, which was in opposition to the Israeli state, there was a lobby to the vice chancellor to get me fired from my job because of, uh, of my views on the conflict. Uh, fortunately, the vice chancellor paid absolutely no attention. But whereas the vice chancellor of UJ paid no attention, uh, there are British universities which have thrown out uh, Jewish academics who are critical of the state of Israel. Uh, there's huge pressure on uh, American Jewish academics who take this position. Uh, so we now it's escalating in a sense. It's now you're not just vilified, you're not just marginalized, uh, you, your, your, your livelihood may be threatened as well. What do you think are the causes of the current rightward shift in Israeli politics towards a more ethnic nationalist view? Well, the point is that it's always been, you know, that's another of the misconceptions. I do mention this in passing in the book, although that's not the main topic of the book. Uh, but uh, the Israeli state has always been an ethnic nationalist project, by definition almost. It might have taken them until 2019 to pass a law saying that, look, this is a state for Jew Jewish people only. And if you happen not to be Jewish, you don't really belong here. But that's what they've always thought. Uh, and previously, tactically, they felt it was necessary to be more moderate than they are now. But clearly, they don't feel that any longer. Uh, and certainly, as long as the present situation prevails, and they can do just about anything they want, and in fact, judging by the last three weeks, every anything they want, and will still enjoy the uncritical support of the, the United States of America and much of Western Europe, uh, they will see no need to, to moderate their position. If you go back to the founding of the state, the, the first prime minister of the Israeli state is a man called David Ben-Gurion, uh, who is now regarded as a sort of moderate, uh, liberal uh, person, etc. Uh, I mean, he wrote a letter to his son, which I, I mentioned in the book, which in effect said, we're accepting the situation at the moment, but, but you know, in time we'll make sure that we conquer all those lands which we've compromised on at the moment. So the intention was always to create a state for one ethnic group on a territory in which there are multiple ethnic groups. And as we in South Africa know from our apartheid experience, is that uh, when, you, when you do that, you can only do that by suppressing the other group and it becomes inevitable over time, uh, which is what's happened, that people will say, well, you're not doing enough. Uh, you know, the reason these people are still around uh, is because you haven't been strong enough. Uh, remember that uh, some of the right-wing candidates in the last Israeli election, uh, their slogan was, who is the lord of the land? So what they were saying is we need to teach these people a lesson and we need to teach them a lesson about who is boss. Now, that sounds like a new and radical position. But in fact, in the 1920s, uh, a man called Jabotinsky, who was a, a, a right-wing Zionist, wrote about what he called the Iron Wall. And what Jabotinsky said there is, look, the, the, the Palestinians, I mean, he called them Arabs, but the Palestinians are never going to accept uh, a, a state by another people on their land. So the only way to have that state, said Jabotinsky, 
was to show them that resistance is pointless because show them that who's in charge, show them who has the muscle, who has the strength. Uh, and although he was a right-wing Zionist, uh, I mean, his position was uh, adopted by other Zionists uh, who were supposed to be liberal and even call themselves left-wing. So really the whole state has been based on this principle of the iron wall, which is don't negotiate, uh, don't compromise, show them who's boss, uh, and then they will get the message and uh, let us do what we want to do. Uh, and all that's happening at the moment, quite frankly, is that's becoming more explicit than it was before. In your opinion, why has the Israeli cause engendered such sizable support from the United States and other Western countries? And could there be a link with white supremacist views of the world? Well, there's a very strong link with white supremacists. I mean, at the, expre at the, at the extreme end of, of white supremacy, right at the beginning of the book, I, I illustrate the point by, by mentioning that uh, on January the 6th, 2021, that, that uh, infamous day in which Donald Trump's supporters tried to overturn the result of the American election at the Capitol, uh, among Trump's supporters were large numbers of white supremacists. And some of them were, were wearing T-shirts cheering on the Nazi mass murder of the Jews. Uh, and in fact, one T-shirt said the Nazis hadn't killed enough Jews. At the same time, the same groups of demonstrators were carrying Israeli flags. Uh, so they hate Jews, but they love the Israeli state. Uh, but even in the, the more moderate Western, as you point out, I mean, Biden and, and, and the Secretary of State are not right-wing white supremacists. Uh, the state of Israel has a free pass. Uh, and I try to explain the reason for that in the book. Uh, the first reason is guilt about centuries of European anti-Semitism, which is real. There have been centuries of, of, of European anti-Semitism culminating, of course, in the Nazi genocide of, of, of six million Jews and millions of other people. Uh, and because the West feels guilty about that, they feel it necessary to support the Israeli state because they feel that by doing that, they will indicate uh, that they're sorry for what they did to the Jewish people. Now, that is a very colonial thing to do because, of course, what they're doing is they're forcing millions of Palestinians to suffer for what white Europeans have been doing to Jews centuries. You know, the Palestinians must pay the price for the Nazis and for all the other antecedents. But there's also something else going on there which is that most, many, many Jews have, I mean, they've been Jews in Europe for, for, for centuries, many, many centuries. And although those Jews lived in Europe, they were not quite accepted in Europe. And one of the effects of the Nazi genocide was to so uh, horrify the Western world uh, that Jews now became acceptable as Westerners. And this dovetailed very well with what was happening, what, what the Israeli state was all about. Because as I mentioned earlier, the Israeli state is a product of an ideology called Zionism. And Zionism is the belief that Jews should have a, a state for Jews only. If you go back to the origins of Zionism in the book, you see that it was actually started by Jewish people who didn't like Jews. Uh, a man called Theodore Herzl is very famous for this, A.D. Gordon, the very famous psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, who wasn't uh, active in the Zionist movement, but was a very strong supporter. And, and none of these people liked Jews very much. They agreed with the anti-Jewish racists at the time that Jews really just were not as, as civilized as white Western European people. But the difference between them and the anti-Jewish bigots, the anti-Semites, was that the Zionists said all this would be fixed if the Jews had a state. If the Jews had a state, the Zionists insisted, they would become like all the other white Western Europeans and would become acceptable in the club. And in effect, that's what the state's all about. And that's what's happened. So you have a very interesting situation, if you want to look at Western attitudes to this, which are crucial, in which Israel, the Israeli state is constantly referred to as the only democracy in the Middle East. Now, this is not a very logical statement. <laughs> in what way is it a democracy? It's, uh, it has passed a law saying that people who are not Jewish are not entitled to any rights. No democracy does that. It practices discrimination against people because of their ethnic origin. 
It has since 1967, in effect, ruled over millions of Palestinians without giving them basic rights. And, and then, just to, to illustrate the point, when in, 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 in the early 2000s, the Palestinians hold an election and they elect a party which the Americans and the United States doesn't like, then that result is overturned and we're living with the results of that now. So it's not a democracy. So why do they call it a democracy? They call it a democracy because it's Western. Because most of the people in the state, although there are many other people not like that, the, the whole ethos of the state is, is, is white West. And therefore, democracy is really, when they say the only democracy in the Middle East, they really mean the only Western state in the Middle East. And there's a very strong South African parallel here, because, you know, we remember that at the end of apartheid, from about the mid-1980s, the West supported non-racial democracy here. But it didn't always support non-racial democracy here. It had to be dragged kicking and screaming by protests on the streets of London and New York and Paris into, into, into doing that. And the reason it didn't think that human rights were a problem here is that the people running white South Africa were Westerners. So they were, they, they were one of us, if you want to put it that way. They, 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 they were our people. And that's really what's happening with the Israeli state today. So, so as long as they are, you know, they, they have a Western way of life, they, they uh, support, uh, you know, the value system of the West, etc., then they will have uncritical support. And that uncritical support will be on the basis of, well, this is the only democracy in the Middle East, where actually what they're saying is uh, it's the only white Western holdout in the Middle East. How important is the United States of America? So it was ensuring the long-term survival of Israel. Absolutely crucial. Absolutely crucial. Uh, one of the chapters in my book looks at this question. And essentially what, what the chapter shows, you, you know, if you talk to supporters of the Israeli state, long-time Zionists, etc., they tell you, well, this state uh, means that Jews are now safe because, you know, nobody can tell Jews what to do. They're not dependent on anybody else. But in fact, uh, if you look through history, uh, Jewish states, and there have been Jewish states before in, in, in ancient history, have always been dependent on a larger power to survive. That, that was how it worked in the ancient world, because you had, you know, you had the Egyptians and the Babylonians, etc., and the Assyrians, you had tremendously powerful and they had empires, etc. And if you were in their good books, you could carry on with your state. And if you weren't, they sent, uh, they sent men with swords to, to, to sort you out. And it's no different today. I mean, the, the, the only reason the state of Israel survives is because of American support. Uh, and that support comes in, it, it's, it's material support, as we know, in the form of finance. It's military support. Uh, it's uh, guns and, 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 and weapons. And, of course, crucially, it's political support, as we're seeing in a situation today where uh, I mean, world opinion is overwhelmingly in favor of an end to the violence in Gaza, and the Americans are blocking that with their veto. So, you know, the irony is that the state, I mean, it, it's not going to happen, but if you had a, a massive change in power in America tomorrow at the next election in which some president was elected who was opposed to the Israeli state, and withdrew all the support, it would find it very difficult to survive, quite frankly. And if it did survive, uh, it would have to behave very differently to the way it's behaving now, because it would not have the kind of uh, blank check which it enjoys at the moment. So, yeah, I, I mean, in, in a sense, the future of, of the Israeli state depends to some extent on what happens in Washington. To what extent does the Jewish faith continue to shape the moral attitudes of Jews? Well, it depends which Jews. I mean, this is the, the irony of the, the, the good Jew, bad Jew distinction. At its beginnings, first point is Zionism, this belief in an Israeli state, rejected the Jewish faith. They said the reason why the Jews were, were being discriminated against were victims of anti-Semitism was because they spent their time studying religious books and praying when they should be out there fighting. Uh, and they said, this is nonsense. You don't protect yourself by, by sitting in a, a synagogue mumbling prayers. Uh, you, you have to abandon it. Um, so, but at, one, at some point, they realized the obvious point, which is that the Jewish faith had been around for a very long time. 
And many Jews uh, believed strongly in that faith. And if they simply excluded those Jews, they wouldn't have had much of a movement. So, so they started adapting to the ideas of the Jewish faith. And what, what, what happened over a period of time is that they're now the majority of people who preach and teach the Jewish faith uh, support the Israeli state. But that doesn't mean that traditional Jewish values support the Israeli state. And there are still a lot of people who adhere to the Jewish faith who do not support the Israeli state. I mean, just to give you a current example, uh, there was a very powerful demonstration in the capital, in Washington, D.C., a few days ago, led by rabbis, led by Jewish uh, religious teachers, dressed in their traditional Jewish prayer regalia with with various ritual, uh, rituals associated with Jewish prayer, etc. Uh, so the point is that the world is being told that belief in the Jewish faith means that you support the state of Israel. That is simply untrue. <laughs> it's absolutely untrue. There are very religious sections of the Jewish people who regard any support for the state of Israel as a mortal sin. If you know your Bible, one of them compared be supporting the Israeli state to worshipping the golden calf, which was about the biggest sin anybody committed in the whole of the Hebrew Bible. So I think the best way to put this is that Jewish faith is now contested. There are those people who adhere to the Jewish faith who support the Israeli state. There are people who adhere to the Jewish faith who oppose the Israeli state. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's simply misleading to insist, as some people do, that if you adhere to the Jewish faith, you have to support the state of Israel. Finally, what lessons can one draw from your book regarding how we in South Africa should best deal with racial and ethnic differences? Yeah, look, there's several. The book actually has two chapters at the end which deal precisely with that. What does this mean with, for South Africa and the world? I think the first thing we need to understand in South Africa from this, and it, it follows directly from this particular example, is that you cannot get rid of racism by suppressing anti-racism. And I'm afraid that is an issue in South Africa today. Because quite frankly, in South Africa today, whenever a, a black person in public life, and sometimes not even in public life, uh, and I do quote examples of this in the book, stands up and says, look, white racism in this country is still a problem that we need to deal with, uh, they are vilified as racists and as people who are playing the race card, etc., etc. And this is not the way you create a non-racial society, because the fact of the matter is that we, may, we had a constitutional settlement in 1994, uh, but racial prejudices didn't miraculously disappear in a puff of smoke because we had a constitutional settlement. They still exist, and people have a perfect right. Not only do people have a right to call them out, people have a duty to call them out so that we can make progress to a, to a non-racial society. So I think that's one very important point. And I do mention examples in the book of the way in which uh, people uh, in this country who, who call out racism are really fine. And this is not only an issue in South Africa. Uh, just remember this trend, which the, the supporters of the Israeli state hooked onto, of saying that people who are in favor of non racialism are really racist, was actually started in the United States in the 1970s uh, when whites took universities to court. Uh, and said, look, you're practicing affirmative action, you're, you're giving places to black, black students, and that's anti-white racism. Uh, and that has been, since then, has been you know, constantly used uh, by, 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 by white people uh, who want to cling on to racism, those white people who do want to cling on to racism, uh, to silence people who don't. The big issue in the UK, uh, not so long ago, so anybody who stood up and said, we don't want statues of, of, of slave owners in our squares, was accused of being a racist because they were discriminating against white tradition. Apparently it's white tradition to own, own other people. Um, the second lesson, which I think people need to understand here, and that's, uh, that's quite a complicated debate, but I go into it in one, one section, is that we need to avoid what I call essentialism. And essentialism is this idea which is very familiar to South Africans, that, you know, all black people are the same, or all white people are the same, or all black people think the same, or all white people think the same. Um, and you might think that that died with apartheid, but it hasn't died with 
apartheid. I mean, it, it rears its head here all the time. Uh, you have people talking about you are offending white sentiment. Well, which white sentiment? The different white sentiment. Uh, you, you, that's not consistent with black culture. Which black culture? There are dozens of black cultures, <laughs> different cultures which black people <laughs> adhere to. So this, this essentialism is, is a big part of the problem because you see then you, the essentialism in my, you know, in, in the Jewish example, well, the, well, the real Jews are the Jews who support the state of Israel. The other ones are fake Jews. They're not fake Jews. They're Jews with a different opinion. Similarly, you know, white people who don't go with the white consensus are people with a different opinion. Uh, black people have a variety of cultural practices and understandings, and there's no, no one is better than any of the others. The final point I want to make, which is highly controversial in South Africa today, is what is the origin of all this, the, the, this that I'm writing about? It's, it's this fanatical belief in a state that somehow if, if you have a state, things will be wonderful, and if you don't have a state, things will be terrible. And what is the South African application? Well, we have a great many South Africans, and it's a very popular tradition at the moment, who seem to think that somehow the South African state, which in its current form is only 29 years old, is some kind of sacrosanct thing which nobody can violate. And how do they express that? Well, they express that by becoming very excited about people who come from another state. So they get very excited if you happen to be born in Zimbabwe, I mean, born in Lesotho or Mozambique. And, you know, what is the foundation for this? Uh, I mean, yes, our present state may only be 29 years old. I mean, the irony of this is that very often the South Africans are saying, well, if you weren't born in the South African state, then you don't belong here, of forgetting that most of the boundaries that they are so excited about protecting were actually created by white colonists. Uh, you know, the fact that a Zimbabwean person on, on one side of the border uh, and you have a South African person on the other side of the border, what separated them? Some colonial bureaucrat who decided that the, the one place was called Rhodesia and the other place was called South Africa. Uh, and it seems to me to be uh, unfortunate and quite irrational that we've invested, so many people have invested all this energy in trying to work out who belongs in this country and who doesn't. Uh, and who is fit to be part of the state. Uh, it, it doesn't work in the Middle East, and it's not going to work well here. That was author and political scientist Professor Stephen Friedman discussing his latest book, Good Jew, Bad Jew.